our next lecture. The last time we had a recorded lecture, we talked about the time value of money, how to convert sums that you are going to uh, spend or receive in the future to a present value, and then how to take that present value and turn that into an annualized cost. <clears throat> we're doing that as a tool, which we're now going to employ in the use of heavy equipment, such as what you see in front of you, um, a sheep's foot, a, sm ro a smooth roller, a, and a couple of uh, motor graders, all of which we'll be talking about individually. <clears throat> but in order to get them onto the site and working, it is necessary for you to understand how much it's going to cost so that you can estimate the jobs properly. And let's talk about ownership and operating costs. The ownership and operating costs of a vehicle need to be known so that you can properly bid the project and that you can manage the project while it's going on. Often the vehicles are expensive enough that you cannot pay for them on one project. And besides, it's, it's inappropriate to treat this as a project cost in terms of most of these values. What typically a company will do is have a motor pool, a, uh, a pool of equipment that is charged to the project by the hour, by the week, by the year, by the month, whatever it is, and that is used. There's a fleet manager and the fleet uh, processes and everything else, and so um, you pay a, a sum to the, um, back to what would be head office or a cost as, a, as assigned to your project for the vehicles and equipment that you have on site. Emphasis on have on site and not use. Because typically if, um, if you're renting and you can think of your uh, company's fleet as a as a internal rental, uh, they're going to bill you for the vehicle whether you choose to use it or not. Um, and we need to uh, talk about the difference between renting, <coughs> leasing, and uh, and purchasing. Well, there's one important factor that we need to know, and that is that in order to bid on a project, you need to put up a bid bond. And then when you're awarded the project, you have to put up a performance bond. A bid bond is a legal agreement that says that I will do this work or it can be done for this price. A performance bond is a legal agreement that says, I will be able to complete the project as is intended. In those cases where either A, you have grossly over underestimated the cost, or B, where you are unable to perform, the purpose of the bond is to allow the bondholder, if you're the general contractor, the owner, if you're the... Uh, if you're a subcontractor, it may be the general contractor, to contact the bonding company and have them finish the project in your place. Now, of course, they don't have uh, um, insurance uh, for doing that. Uh, they rely on the money that you pay to generate the bond. But more importantly, they want you to have some skin in the game. So if you are in a project where you're going to walk away from it and the performance bond will be, will be pulled, to use the term, and um, the bonding company or the surety has to step in and finish the work, they want to get the resources to do so. And so one of the places that they will look for the resources to do so is inside your company because you have uh, like, a bill, like a bail bond you have committed to do something and you have secured it, uh, secured your promise in the case of a bail bond with, uh, with money that is, uh, is due if you don't show up, or rather that's seized if you don't show up. The bonding company will give you a bonding capacity. In other words, 
you, this is the amount of bond that you can put out at a certain percentage, a small percentage, but if a small percentage of a big number is a big number. And they want it secured. And the best way to secure it is that they want to have enough capital in the company that if they have to litigate, that there is something to, uh, to take. And so that's why very frequently you own all of this equipment, not because necessarily it's cheaper to own it than rent or lease, but because then you will increase your bonding capacity. So this is a very important part of, uh, of con the construction process is to have this uh, have capital within the company. And that's why we hold that capital in the company and why we use an interest internally to, uh, to make sure that we are recovering uh, that capital and that capital is growing. So you could run your construction company and never make a dollar on any of the projects if you did a project by project analysis, but the overall company makes a great deal of money because it has a very high interest rate. Uh, and some companies are run that way. So let's take a look. What are ownership and operating costs? The first is you have to purchase the vehicle. So you go down to the local showroom, you kick some tires, you drink some of their coffee, and you buy a piece of equipment, and uh, just like you were buying a car. Uh, the difference is that um, you can add another zero, typically, at the end of what the price is, of very expensive equip pieces of equipment. One of the things that becomes interesting is you also purchase the tires, and you may purchase that as a, as a deal, but you treat the two as though they're different. And that's because the vehicle will have a long life, six, eight, 10 useful years, but the tires won't last that long. And so the tires are going to need to be replaced and you know they're gonna to need to be replaced. And so tires are capitalized, <clears throat> treated as a capital asset, and may in, in, in uh, 10 years, you may have to put five sets of tires on there. You know, you'll never uh, complain about buying $150 a piece special truck tires when you find out that there are uh, tires for scrapers that are five or $6,000 a piece, brand new. And they don't see very many retreads because the tires are usually uh, done in fairly badly. We're gonna talk about tires in some detail uh, in um, in the subsequent lectures. You also have an overhaul. You bring the vehicle in, you uh, pull out the power pack, you rehabilitate the power pack of the engine, you uh, check the hydraulic motors, you, you remove a large part of the systems and you rebuild them. Uh, overhauls are, uh, you know, they're not annual expenses. They happen every uh, four, three, five years, depending on the vehicle and what you're doing with it and the manufacturer's quality. And so that is a price you're going to have to pay. And so we're going to capitalize that because at some point you're going to need that money and you want to make sure that that is part of your annual operating costs, even if and even in a year where you don't do an overhaul. We also have maintenance. There's major maintenance and there is on-site maintenance. And typically, <coughs> typically, if it's over a couple thousand dollars, then that maintenance will be capitalized. Otherwise, uh, you would run it as an operating expense. In other words, you'd have a budget that you need $2,000 a year uh, to uh, maintain the vehicle. <clears throat> and we're gonna charge that directly to the, the job by adding it as an operating cost as opposed to an ownership cost. Fuel is an operating cost. The vehicle sits in a yard or sits uh, in a garage. It doesn't burn any fuel, so it only burns fuel when it's being used, so fuel is an operating cost. Similarly, oil, lubricants, filters, seals, sandwiches, coffee holders, all these sorts of things that, uh, that are used only when the vehicle's in operation uh, are operating costs. But interestingly enough, the operator is not the oper an operating cost. The operator is a labor cost. Labor costs are gonna be treated separately. The reason we do that is because the machines um, only get paid, quote unquote, or only are paying you when they're working. But uh, you have to pay your labor when it's on site, independent of whether it's working or not. So we have, um, we have all of these ownership and operating costs, and there's a lot of ways of handling them. We're going to address 
the the one that we uh, that is used most frequently, which is the present value method. And so we're going to have to use economic formulas. Fairly simple. We need to make sure that the revenue that we're receiving for the vehicle is greater than the ownership and operating costs, or else we're losing money every hour for every vehicle. And successful equipment management is critical to construction. It's based on a correct estimate of the ownership costs, any way you choose to look at them, and understanding that those ownership costs are going to decline with age, and the operating costs, which only occur when things are used, and are going to increase with age. And when do we get all of this information? There's two sources. The first is the contractor or the company will have an accounting system that says, you know, on average, Every time I use an automatic uh, tree killer uh, machine uh, with giant buzz saws, uh, it costs a dollar an hour for um, for bandages for the flying stuff that's uh, going uh, uh, hitting all of the workers. Whatever, don't hit the workers. Don't don't account for damage. Uh, that don't intend to hurt anybody. But so that would say, well, there's a dollar an hour that we need for bandages. So we have to put that in as an operating cost. Every hour that the machine is operating costs. A dollar, um, and you, you may find out that uh, that our over average overhaul cost for a scraper is eight thousand five hundred dollars, and so let's assume that that's the number. Sometimes it'll be higher, sometimes it'll be lower. But if we're managing a fleet, we need uh, we we can't treat individual vehicles as individuals. So that's our historical data. Also have the manufacturer's literature. And uh, we're going to see some um, some items today that come out of manufacturer's literature. We're going to get deep into the manufacturer's liter literature because it's going to be required when we try to estimate what work a machine can do. So we separate things. The first is the ownership costs. All right, a little glitch there, sorry about that. So we're back and um, our, uh, if we if we look at what we're doing, we have two things that are going on. The first is that our ownership cost is gonna fall over time because as we pay off the vehicle, um, and we should be aware that the longer that we own the vehicle, the lower our overall ownership cost is. So if you like to have new fleets of vehicles that are only five years old because uh, you feel that it keeps your operating cost down, that's quite a uh, quite a respectable thing to do because the operating costs go up as the vehicle ages. And those of you <laughs> who own or know someone who owns a car knows that this is absolutely the case. So the ownership cost going down is really because we spread the cost of that vehicle over more years. Our operating costs are going to go up. But vehicles, there are parts that wear out that uh, that just wear out. Vehicles get get old, and uh, there is quite a market for uh, for used equipment. Uh, you're going to see that in uh, in the assignment that uh, is up on uh, Canvas. To, uh, along with this uh, requirement, is to go and, uh, and and look at some of those sites and get an idea of the condition and the cost of various things. But um, you should be aware that the longer we own the vehicle, the lower our ownership costs, the higher our operating costs. And so we can do an analysis and see at what point is the optimum uh, for a particular type of vehicle to be, uh, to be selling it. The reason that there are used equipment is because your ownership cost starts out lower, much lower. So you can live with a higher operating cost. And there are people that buy brand new pieces of equipment, and there are people that uh, that have a, a large fleet of used vehicles. Used vehicles, of course, uh, aren't as useful for the bonding company as uh, as new vehicles are, so that we can run into some conflicts there. So remember, uh, contracting is a compl complicated business. 
So our ownership costs, we have depreciation, loss in value, which we have to account for. We know the purchase price. We estimate our ownership period, the number of hours of use. We estimate our salvage value. Salvage value is what the, is the vehicle worth when we are no longer interested in operating it. And this would be what you would sell it on the uh, to a used dealer or sell it back to a traded in value for a to, for new equipment. And that salvage value we have to estimate at the time of purchase. We also have an interest rate. Okay, that represents our financial burden uh, that we want to increase our uh, our costs. We'll have taxes. We'll have uh, insurance. We just to mitigate risk, and so we typically assign a, an insurance cost. We have storage costs because uh, you don't necessarily want to store this equipment in the in the, in weather, in all types of weather. However, um, sometimes storage costs just a fence around it, and then a license fee if it's applicable. Again, the more we use the vehicle every year, the more rapid that cost is going to draw. So. Let's take the tools that we learned about the time value of money and apply them to financing equipment, but also to determining what does it cost to operate a piece of equipment on your site. So let's take a look. We have a contractor. We're purchasing a track dozer for $155,000. And we're estimating that every year we'll use it about 2,000 hours. I had a little bit of uh, humor once an accountant told me, uh, Kevin, you've uh, charged more than 2,080 hours um, uh, on uh, in chargeable time in a particular year. Don't you know there's only 2,080 hours? And I said, well, there is if you work eight hours a day. If you uh, work 12 hours a day, that's not the case. So it told me something about that, that gentleman for sure. But um, in this case, based on our history, we'll use about 2,000 hours per year of this particular type of tract dozer. The salvage value, the end of the tractor's life, is 12% of the purchase price. It's an assumption based on the company records or based on uh, industry trends. You can get uh, all this information, particularly if you're buying a new vehicle, Places like Caterpillar or Komatsu or um, or any of those heavy equipment manufacturers will be able to tell you what the typical uh, salvage value is after you've used it for a certain amount of time. And uh, the contractor's uh, ownership costs to be, well, I'm using an internal interest rate inside the company because I have, I have the cash to do this at 9%. And uh, I don't need a license because I intend to operate it off the highway. In other words, it's we're going to be pushing soil around before there's a road, not running on the existing road. So what is the estimated annual ownership cost, just the ownership cost of this dozer if it's operated under average conditions? And this is the type of question that, um, that you need to answer in order to bid a particular project. So let's start. We can, uh, we can go to places like Caterpillar Manufacturers Equipment. And it tells us that a track dozer under average working conditions is going to be able to work for 12,000 hours before it's, uh, before it's basically used up and, and, and needs a lot of work. That 12,000 hours divided by our estimated usage of 2,000 hours per year gives us a life of six years. The minimum rate of return in this particular case, because of the way we're doing it, is only 9%, not 14. So we're only going to use uh, this 9%. All of these are other numbers that... um, that are sometimes used in analysis. In this particular case, we're not going to do that. It has a lot to do with with separating out where your money is going. So first thing we have to do is we're going to sort out what's the present worth of our salvage value. 
And our salvage value, right, we said it was 12% of $155,000. And we multiply that, we need to, what's the present value of that future value? There's our discount factor is um, one over one plus the interest rate raised to the power n, the number of years. And that gives us a salvage value of $11,090. And so you can see here, this is our cash flow. Right? We sink $155,000. Six years later, we get out $155,000. And so that this value converted to the present is equal to 0 0.12 multiplied by 155,000 divided by 1 plus the interest rate to the number of periods, which is the calculation we did above. So what we're looking at is we're putting a number in that is uh, looking at our, where our salvage is coming from. We can add that together, and this gives our, uh, our $155,000 minus eleven thousand and ninety two which is one hundred and forty three dollars nine hundred eight right bucks the annual cost of ownership is one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars we're now going to convert this to if I own this vehicle over six years what is the value of the vehicle so um, i convert it back and this is the value of our um, our vehicle for the first uh, for six years annualized every year and if we uh, if we uh, subtract off our salvage value which we we have in this uh, in this case because it's a present value we end up with this number, right? It's the wrong number. My apologies for that. But it, this would be what we're doing. And this is the discount factor. This is the annual payment given a present value, interest rate, and number of periods. So this is our cost, which included this cash flow analysis, giving us an annual payment or a series of payments. This year, we intend to, and every year, we intend to operate at 2,000 hours a year. So our hourly cost of ownership is $24,152.11, which is uh, this number here, divided by 2,000 hours per year, giving us a value or a cost of $12.08 an hour for the for what they would say for the iron for the steel and uh, the, all the parts of the vehicle its ownership cost exclusive of maintenance however we should also be aware that the um, that there are no tires on a tracked vehicle and the tracks don't wear out they uh, are caught in uh, in an overhaul system so when uh, when uh, the vehicle is overhauled, you may put new tracks on at that point, or you'd probably just refurbish the tracks. Okay. Operating costs. Operating costs are influenced by the age of the vehicle, the state of repair, the operating conditions, and there are various types. So the, where do, or do these... Uh, do these uh, costs come from? Well, we have maintenance and repair. And maintenance and repair um, could be uh, main equipment, the cost for, uh, for uh, re re uh, reinstalling tires, replacing the tires, other components that need to be repaired. Then there's fuel, and then service, filters, oil and grease, and then other operating costs, like every Friday you have to buy Kevin a sandwich or he doesn't work as hard. There's also downtime. And we're going to talk about a concept of efficiency, which will account for our downtime. There's the operator, 
of its uh, labor. And again, as the vehicle gets used and it, uh, its cost goes, uh, goes uh, these costs will go up over time. Let's look at maintenance and repair costs. Equipment is going to have two types of maintenance. It's going to have routine, regular maintenance, maintenance and we'll have overhauls. Overhaul is a, um, <clears throat> is a major rebuilding of the equipment. So the equipment, uh, ideally, when it needs to be overhauled, is not broken on the site, but rather is, uh, is being overhauled at a scheduled time. So we schedule that. We also do maintenance in the field. So, uh, you know, the parts that uh, are wearing out, uh, oil changes, all those other things are done uh, when the equipment is idle on the site. And so if you've been on a site, you know that, say, Caterpillar will send a service tech around who will service all the vehicles overnight so that they're ready to go again in the morning. Tires are wear parts, and they're going to be replaced. And we're going to capitalize those just the way we capitalized the, uh, the salvage value. So the first thing that we need to do is we would subtract from the purchase price of a whole equipment unit, the tires, and we'll treat the tires differently. And we treat them in a cash flow analysis. Tire wear is affected by the maintenance, speed, and the operating conditions which the vehicle operates. If you are driving rubber tires over shattered rock, then those tires are not going to last very long. If you're driving them on smooth, sandy surfaces that are well-maintained, then they will last a very long time. And so the conditions what we're using are going to make a difference for tire. And then, of course, the quality of the tires that we manufacture. And as I said, we're going to have a, a, a detailed discussion of tires and how we account for tires. So we can, again, look up this type of information. How long do tires last? In, a, um, in vehicles based on uh, the conditions in which they're operating. And so these things are tabulated. This is, uh, this is taken from, uh, from someone's textbook. Uh, you can get this same information out of Caterpillar or out of Komatsu or out of uh, any of those manufacturers. The second we need to be aware of is fuel costs. Two kinds of engines, right? We have spark ignition with gasoline and compression ignition for diesel, and typically for diesel, we will use, uh, or typically for, sorry, on-site construction equipment, we'll use diesel because it's more efficient. You get uh, more horsepower from a diesel engine burning the same amount of fuel as than you do from a gasoline engine. You won't win any drag races, which is why there's no diesel drag race competition, because the power is not uh, available very quickly. Uh, but it is uh, much higher than the amount of power that's used for, for gasoline. So if you're uh, running a, a race car, you're using gasoline. If you're running a pump, it just has to work. You're using diesel. And then we have the rate of fuel consumption or our fuel factor, or fuel or uh, rate of consumption. It's just the, based on the duty cycle of the engine, the operating conditions. And then we have the cost of fuel, right? And... Uh, Either if we look at our fuel consumption and uh, multiply that by our fuel cost, then we do end up with a uh, with a overall cost of fuel. We also need to look at our hourly fuel cost, and we need to uh, need to do that because we need a certain amount of uh, of um, flywheel horsepower. And the equation that flipped up on the screen momentarily is an equation for calculating that. We don't use that method, so I'm going to ignore it. This, um, this is a, uh, also tied to that method, so we can, uh, we can not look at that. What we're going to do instead is we will have, we will have a, uh, a manufacturer's recommendations as to how many gallons of fuel per hour we're operating when we're under either when we're under high, medium, or low load. And so we could look that up and for a particular piece of equipment, we may find that high is uh, operating at 20 gallons of diesel per hour, that moderate is 16 gallons of diesel per hour, and that low is at four 
gallons of diesel per hour. And uh, so we need to know, and we'll do an example, how quickly we're how frequently we're operating the vehicle with high demand, moderate demand, or medium demand, or low demand on the engines. Services. Servicing costs includes filters, oils, lubricants. So when the uh, the vehicle has an air filter and an oil filter and a whole bunch of other things that we change those filters, <coughs> prolongs the life of our engine and prolongs the life of our oil. We do on occasion have to change the oil as it does get dirty. And then we have lots of parts where there is steel moving on steel and those need to be lubricated with, uh, with uh, mineral grease or we're gonna have a problem. Uh, they can be determined as a, as a percentage of our hourly fuel costs. They're affected by the operating conditions and the age and other factors. Um, you may also <clears throat> just say that uh, your annual cost of fuel, filters and fuel is, is X. It's another method of doing it, and then we'll show you how that method works as well. So um, equipment service cost factors are, are other ways to do it. Uh, there's also other operating costs. One of them is, is a downtime cost. So when the bulldozer is pushing soil or when it's maneuvering to push soil, it's being productive. And we're gonna figure out how to do that calculation here uh, very shortly. And soon we'll be able to estimate the, the, the uh, capacity, the equipment uh, abilities. But for right now, we also know that uh, the operator is going to need a minute or two every every several hours um, to use the facilities that uh, such as they might be. Um, he's gonna stop and get a sandwich. He's he probably brought a sandwich from home. And so he's gonna eat that sandwich and drink his coffee. And then there'll be other times where he can't maneuver because there's a truck in his way. And some amount of time, there'll just be a, a, a period of time when the vehicle is not operating we're not doing productive work and the way that we're going to do that the way we're going to do that for all of these vehicles is we're going to use an efficiency in other words the efficiency is how frequently are you working as a fraction of any amount of time and we're going to do it in a different way <clears throat> we're going to express our efficiency as equal to the actual number of minutes per hour of actual operation so in other words if you um if you're on a site that has uh, has lots of uh, lots of uh, vehicles moving back and forth, and uh, it's in a cram spot, and you can't get out of it, you may have a lower efficiency of use of equipment than you would if you're building a highway where the vehicles are far apart. And so the way that we will talk about that um, is we'll say we have a 45 minute efficiency. That 45 minute efficiency means that for every hour of operation on the site. There's 45 minutes of useful work and 15 minutes of doing nothing. And uh, since these uh, particularly diesel vehicles don't like to be started and, and uh, stopped and started, the vehicles will typically idle even when they're being fueled. So the, um, the, and it's safe to do so because without compression, the diesel oil doesn't burn. And, um, we need to be aware that we're going to use efficiency to say that every 60 minutes we're working for 45 minutes. So when we calculate our cost for fuel, for example, when we look at how much load is on the engine during working, we also have to account for a fact that there's a lot of there could be a lot of idle time. And we have labor costs. We use local data, wage and fringe benefits. Um, we're going to have a discussion uh, here very shortly about the Davis-Bacon Act, which is the so-called prevailing wage, that you must pay an operator the prevailing wage. And uh, so we can look up in Dunn County what the prevailing wage for a heavy equipment operator or a dump truck driver or whatever else uh, you might be having to do. We can find out what that cost is, and um, that is that will be our cost, and then there'll be fringe benefits, right? The, unemployment insurance, workers' comp, uh, vacation, retirement, medical, uh, or anything else that goes on, all those sorts of things will be, uh, will be accounted for. So <clears throat> let's apply all of this and show you how we're going to 
account for all of these things. So we, um, excuse me, let's do an example because it's easier to see it as an example. We're going to apply all of the principles that we outlined above. A contractor purchases a wheeled loader for $250,000, plans to use it for about 2,000 hours per year. At this usage rate, the contractor anticipates disposing of the loader after using it for six years and realizing a salvage value of $60,000. Tires for the loader cost $12,000 for a set of four tires. The tires will need to be replaced every 4,000 hours. Diesel fuel costs $3.90 per gallon delivered to the site. And then the rate of return or an interest rate of 12%. What are the contractor's estimated hourly ownership and operating costs for the loader? So this is looking at <clears throat> a wheeled vehicle and a wheeled piece of equipment as tires. The tires that you purchase at the time you receive the vehicle are not going to last as long as the vehicle or else you have a pretty crappy vehicle or, or, or completely awesome tires, neither of which exist. So we are going to uh, have to treat the tires as a capital cost. And that capital cost has to take into account that the tires will have no salvage value when they're done, that they cost $12,000 and that our estimated tire life, <clears throat> they said we said they would last for 4,000 hours, divided by 2,000 hours per year of operation. The tires are going to last us for two years. We need to separate this tire cost from the ownership cost. And so we're going to have an hourly ownership initial cost of the vehicle is going to be converted from the $250,000 we paid for it. Well, that came with a set of $12,000 tires. So the purchase price was $238,000. Now we could do this separately, right? We could uh, have, a, uh, have a time value for the tires. And um, if we did that, Every two years, we need to buy a new set of tires. We're not going to be able to sell it with tires that are dead. So um, we can figure out what this looks like. We could calculate this. The present value of the tires is equal to 12000 Just the first one, right? That's one divided by one plus the interest rate to the year n minus one. A raised to the power n minus one, where n is equal to one, is equal to a to the power zero, which is equal to one. So in this case, our discount factor is going to be one over one plus the interest rate raised to the power two. Here is one over one plus the interest rate raised to the power four. And here is one over one plus the interest rate raised to the power six. And so our tire life, we need to convert it to be a present value. We can convert that present value, which is equal to 12,000 plus one plus one over 1.09, so 12, right? 1.12 squared plus one over 1.12 to the power four plus one over 1.12 raised to the power six. And that will come out to be a number. And we can compute what that number is uh, fairly readily. So let's see. 
let's do this one. So we have $12,000 at year zero. We have $12,000 divided by 1.12 squared. And I do live, uh, this live from as I'm recording it. Um, that's uh, 1.12 squared is equal to $9,566.33. And this is a present value of a future cost. And so we can capitalize this cost, right? We're gonna and lump this in. Uh, the next uh, set of tires is 12,000 divided by 1.12 raised to the power four. And this is $7,626.22. And that final set of tires, 12,000 divided by 1.12 raised to the exponent six. And that's equal to $6,079.57. What this means is I have to have $6,079.57 bank today so that at accruing nine percent interest so that at some point uh, in the future it's worth twelve thousand dollars in fact six years into the future we can uh, we can add up all of those uh, all of those costs 76 26.22 plus 95 66.33 plus twelve thousand. So the present value of all of our tires is $35,272.12. So we then can put this present value in and use it to calculate some of our, calculate our, uh, our annual cost. So this is what we just did. Very nice, do all these nice calculations. Our, uh, our ownership cost, $238,000, which is the $250,000 price less the, um, less the tires. We are gonna recover a value of 60,000 at six years. We've got our purchase price for the tires at 12. We already know our tires aren't worth anything when they're done. We can compute our hourly operating cost in the, as well because we're going to do away with uh, with the tires we also have to include include our maintenance and repair now our maintenance is going to be scheduled because the cost of down equipment is quite high if you have an excavator that that breaks down on the site and it's serving 20 trucks in a in a spread of equipment to move soil from one location to the next um, not only is the the uh, the shovel lying idle so are all 20 trucks so we don't like equipment that breaks down and is used for for and holds us up because the cost of an hour of a fleet of trucks um, could be a couple thousand dollars so we want to make sure that we're not wasting that money because we're, we spend it, but where it's not productive. So let's say we have, I don't know, a $10,000 overhaul at three years. And um, we're going to expense in this particular case, our maintenance, our seals and our fluids, you know, lubrication, brake fluid, coolants, all those other things. But we're going to assume those are $2,000 per year. These are going to be treated not as ownership, but as operating costs. Okay, because you'd obviously you don't have these costs if you don't operate. 
the, the $10,000 overhaul, that's a capital cost because it's been done to preserve the value of the vehicle. So your $10,000 overhaul isn't necessary if you don't use the vehicle, but if you're not using the vehicle, it really doesn't matter. At three years, um, if you have a vehicle that's sitting there has never been used, you should never have purchased it. What we're going to do now is we look at all of these costs. So we have our um, equipment costs, right? Over six years. So we have a purchase price. We put down $238,000. Six years from now, 60000 is one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So now we go the next step. Every two years, I have tires. My tire cost is equal to $12,000 today. My overhaul, I need an overhaul at three and I need an overhaul at six. My overhaul, I said it was $10,000. Well, I can compute this entire stream to be a present value, right? I can calculate that this is, uh, you know, this this uh, discount rate for year one is one plus the interest rate, which is 1.12. It's 1.12 and it's 1.12. Uh, this is squared. This is cubed. This is the power four. Year five, we have no expenses. And here it's 1.12 raised to the power five. So if I um, if I take each of these sums and divide it by this value, I come up with a present value. And since the best one to look at is the uh, is let's say these tires, this is how we came up with it, right? We had twelve thousand dollars divided by 1.12 squared, so multiplied by one over that. Uh, that um, conversion factor. And you probably remember what the number is, but for some reason at the moment, I don't. It's 9,000 and something. So that's $9,566.33. Well, if I, if I take an example at six years where I have a lot of expenses, right? I have, I'm gonna get my money back, but I'm also going to have to put in a new set of tires and do an overhaul. The net number here is $60,000 of uh, negative cost, money that's coming in, plus $12,000 set of tires, plus a $10,000 overhaul, gets me $38,000 net. And that's a cost that's coming in, so it's, neg it's a negative cost, right? It's money which's flowing in. I just have to take this number divided by a 1.12 raised to the power of six. In fact, I can sum up each of these columns, treat them with the discount factor, and calculate a present value. And that has, gives me my operating cost. So uh, if, um, if, we, uh, if we do that, we can uh, do some very interesting things. And I'm going to show you how to do that here in a, uh, in a few minutes. But let's talk about how we're going to handle fuel. The first thing we're going to have to do is estimate on the site how often we're going to be using the engine at a high demand, a medium demand, or a low demand. And these, this has to sum to be 100%. So in this particular case, we're assuming that our vehicle will operate 50% of the time with a high engine load, say, um, say pushing soil. 30% at a medium, lifting the soil, pouring it into a, uh, into a container or a vessel or a truck or whatever else it is. And then 20% of the time at low, uh, reversing, moving the engine or moving the vehicle around without any load on it, uh, it's going to be low. We're going to get that either from our reference files for the contract for our own company or our manufacturer's data. Now we said that our fuel cost 
was going to be $3.90 a gallon. So our fuel consumption is 50%, 0.5, operated at the high range, right down here is 12, 30% at medium, and 20% at low. And that gives me an average operating fuel consumption of 8.7 gallons of diesel per hour. My operating fuel cost, 8.7 gallons per hour, $3.90 a gallon, gives me $33.93 of uh, fuel per, per hour. That doesn't look right, does it? 8.7 multiplied by 3.90 is 33.93. Okay, I take it back. 33.93. For efficiency, we're going to use the concept of working minutes per hour. For example, we estimated because the site is uh, is isn't hard to get uh, access to, and there's a uh, it's a uh, soil is not fun to drive over top of we're going to find that uh, there's time spent uh, the vehicle down for whatever reasons, refueling, um, the operator's getting a sandwich and a cup of coffee, whatever else the reasons are, um, it's going to have some downtime, which means that every hour we're operating at 45 minutes and the rest of the time, 60 minus 45 or 15 minutes, the vehicle sitting at idle, which is a low engine low. So our total fuel costs is the weighted average of the fuel costs when it is uh, operating, which was $33.93, and, and the, the uh, weighted amount of time that it sits at idle. If you remember, our idle is gonna be run at low, which is three gallons per hour. So we do this, so there's our, here's our weighted time we're operating at our operating fuel cost, plus our idle time multiplied by our idle consumption rate, multiplied by our idle fuel cost, coming out to be a fuel cost of $28.37 per hour. Um, we're also going to include some uh, some service costs of someone coming out and you know lubricating the the hinge points and changing the oil and all these other things that go on that are the routine maintenance and based on our company records we're going to find out that that's about a dollar per hour for lubricants and grease and that's just the you know that's that's the cost of of running around and the grease needs to be cleaned and redone and everything else so including our tires and maintenance. We come, I ran the calculation, and I'll show you how in a moment, and came up with an equipment ownership cost of $38.12 per hour. My operating costs, maintenance and repair, fuel service, $33.12. So my total ownership and operating cost is $71.24 per hour. So that's the cost to have that machine on the site for an hour. Keep in mind, we don't know how much work you can do in that hour. That's where we're headed. You can estimate operating costs using uh, utilization versus cost reports, which is why we have uh, people uh, record how much equipment use they're getting and what is it costing to have out, uh, out there. Our information systems will have utilization and cost data and purchase and repair and operating cost and uh, fuel oil and uh, lubricants or fuel oil and grease. Or you can use the cost factors in the manufacturer's literature if it's a piece of equipment you're not familiar with. But in many cases, this is why we keep all of these records in uh, inside of a construction company so that we can better estimate what it's going to cost to do an actual project. Utilization is the working time duration, not the calendar duration. We can look at how we charge our equipment back to the um, back to 
projects. We could do that an hourly or a daily or a weekly basis, and it really depends on what the equipment is doing. We can uh, we can also do it on miles. So if anyone has ever uh, used their company vehicle or used sorry used their personal vehicle on company business, you'll know that the IRS says that the cost of operating a vehicle is fifty five cents a mile, and that's all all in, and they publish that as a new number every year. But uh, there's our, uh, those are ways for accounting for these costs. You could um, you could look at how much your fuel uh, consumption is going on. And you can answer your questions by doing this type of analysis. What are the reasonable rental rates for internal costs? In other words, if I have a bulldozer, you can rent one from Bulldozers R Us with the R backwards, of course, uh, and it'll be cost you uh, forty-eight fifty-two a year. Um, what is my reasonable internal rental rate? That, uh, that I don't uh, drive all my project managers to rent everything because I will need to keep some capital in here, but at the same time that I don't lose money on my fleet. And you can run your fleet as a, a profit center. And then that helps in maintenance and project management decisions. It also helps us to know when we should be replacing vehicles. Um, I spent a long time working for Semstone. And um, Semstone here in Wisconsin is a little bit different from Semstone in the Twin Cities. They're, they operate actually separate companies for starters. But the, uh, the rate of vehicle replacement in the cities is higher than it is in Wisconsin because there's a perception among the ownership that new shiny vehicles are what people want to see. And so um, the average life of a ready mix truck uh, in Semstone's operations in the Twin Cities was about four years. In uh, Semstone's operations in Wisconsin, it was closer to seven, uh, partially because uh, the vehicles were not interchangeable because everyone likes a front discharge in Wisconsin and hates a front discharge in, in the Minneapolis, and it's the reverse for a rear discharge. But there's our, one of the things that happens, of course, if you use a vehicle a short period of time and sell it, it has a very high salvage value. So you have to make that decision. That's a business decision, which uh, uh, which um, you need to to make based on your own uh, understanding of things. So we can now compute our hourly ownership and operating costs, and that that's very valuable. We use that for fleet management. We use that to determine bid prices. So uh, we need to know if we think we need a bulldozer on the site for to move for uh, 550 hours every week. We know how many bulldozers that is, and um, we know what it's going to cost to have them on the site. So we need to build that into our pricing. We are going to marry that with an earth moving unit of cubic yards, and this will be an important value for us. This is the cost, the production cost of a cubic yard of soil. And that production cost is going to be our operating and annual costs divided by the number of, uh, the amount of soil we can move per hour. So our hourly production rates, cubic yards per hour combined with our equipment costs and dollars per hour will give us a cost in dollars per cubic yard. And that's going to be very useful when we start to estimate the projects. And once we have the estimate, it's also extremely useful in managing them. You wanna make sure that if we've assumed that our, um, that our production rate is, uh, is uh, 450 bank cubic yards per hour, that if it drops to 300, we're losing money. If it goes to 500, we're making money. And so you can see where a, a truck boss or a, uh, a, a spread boss is important in making sure that the equipment is operating as efficiently as possible. And we, we'll talk about that after we do a little bit of estimating is how to do uh, uh, monitoring production on the site. Our next lecture is going to be in fundamentals of soil. And um, fundamentals of soil is, uh, is a key understanding in earth moving. If we don't understand the soil that we're using, it becomes very difficult for us to uh, to do otherwise. So I'm going to uh, going to leave that there. Uh, there will be another very uh, 
very uh, short lecture showing you how, just like we did the other day, um, how to calculate all of these uh, all of these costs as a as a worked example, and then there will be an assignment, and I will talk to you next time. Thank you. Goodbye.